Hey everyone, I'm John Platt, the chairman and CEO of Sony Music Publishing. And I feel very, very lucky today to have a conversation with a friend of mine. Um, we want to talk about our journeys and, and basically inclusive leadership. Um, but this, this friend of mine just happens to be one of the greatest songwriters and musical artists of our time, um, the one and only Carol King. And I'm so excited to be able to do this with Carol. Um, just uh, last month, her album Tapestry celebrated its 50th anniversary, which is an incredible uh, feat, uh, an incredible accomplishment to such a, a landmark album and a body of work. Um, over the years, you know, just watching, first of all, I feel lucky to be able to even work with Carol, much less call her a friend. And, you know, just from afar, just being able to, to witness how much she has inspired women songwriters, women artists, um, and just and just uh, musicians and songwriters all over the world is incredibly um, it's incredibly uh, just great for me to be able to sit next to it now. Um, like I said, throughout her career, she's broken down so many barriers, whether she realized it or not at the time, and and fought for so much for women's rights and given a voice to so many that weren't represented um, at that level um, in 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 the in the music business. Um, you know, and myself being a person of color. Um, having achieved what I've been able to achieve. Uh, we both realize there's so much more work to do, but we're happy to um, to have this conversation with you all today and uh, and share our experiences and hope it inspires some of you. So with that, we'll just we'll just jump right into it. And, I, and I'll just start it off with, you know, Carol, I, I think it would be great to like to, just to set the table for both of us to give like a brief, um, a brief story of how we got to where we got to in our lives. Um, so I, I hand it over to you. Well, thank you, John, and um, it's my pleasure to call you friend as well as the person I work with at, at Sony Publishing. Sony Music Publishing has a new name now. That's so awesome, and the logo, and I'm all very excited about it. Um, yeah, um, you spoke about, you know, you, you mentioned breaking down barriers as we each have in our way. I you know, went for what I wanted to do. And I was lucky to be raised in a family where neither of my parents ever told me anything but, yeah, go for it. You know, the, the idea of my gender was never an issue at home. And um, so I did kind of just go for it. And really the barriers, I, I, I didn't have obstacles in my professional career that I perceived, because I just kind of went for stuff and things happened. Where I had the obstacles was balancing that with my personal life, because I was married to my co-writer, and he was really a driving force. I was just happy to be a mom and, you know, do, do my thing at home and write, write the music, and I loved doing that, and I would go into the publisher's offices and play stuff. But he was the driver. Jerry was driven. He really wanted us to succeed and get our, you got to do this and you got to do that. But the infringement in my personal life was that it was hard to separate that. And he didn't, you know, he, his work partner was also his life partner. And that was challenging. And then Jerry, of course, had other challenges. And I think we both had the challenge of being very young. So that's where I ran into the, the challenges. As I like to say, Jerry had a day job. When we were successful with Will You Love Me Tomorrow, he quit his day job. I still had mine. Yeah, you know, it's similar um, story with me. It's just I always, music touched me at a very, very early age in my life. And you know, but once I became super passionate about it, um, I grew up in a single parent home and my mother, she worked um, in the East, or I guess it was called swing shift. So she would work from like three to 11 or what have you. So, you know, those evenings I would be home by myself, just listening to the radio and, you know, recording songs off the radio with my tape recorder and whatnot. But I just always had the, um, she never told me I couldn't do it. You know what I mean? And, and she just, I would be out and about like, you know, um, you know, I was, I was DJing parties as like a 15 year old, you know what I mean? And she would just allow me to do those things. And, 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 and I had the, I had the benefit of growing up in Denver, Colorado. And so, um, and, and this became a very important story. Um, it, uh, part of my journey is that 
you know, in Denver, we didn't have a um, an FM black radio station. It was only an AM black radio station. And the signal would get really, really weak at, 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 um, at nighttime. And so, but the, um, the FM stations, obviously the signal is really strong. And my older brother, um, could we, we grew up in, I lived in Oakland, California first, and then moved to Denver when we was, I was going to the, um, fourth grade, fourth to fifth grade. And my older brother, <clears throat> he started listening to, um, to rock music and, and which is today called classic rock, all of those songs. And so, and, and, you know, I would ask him like, why are you listening to that music or whatever? And, and so the more he played it on the radio, the more I really started to like it. I didn't, I didn't realize um, how important that was in my life where I got to realize that a song was a song and no matter who was singing it. And I started to learn like, you know, a great song is a great song. What, what pushes it into one genre or another is the production of that song. And so, but the, the bones of the great song is pretty much the same across the board. And so um, I, I was able to like, you know, as I then became a DJ and then got into the music business, I had this expansive um, knowledge of music that people that quite frankly looked like me didn't have or weren't expected to have is a better, probably a better way to say it. And it, 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 didn't, it didn't allow me to be put in a box. And, and so, um, you know, it, it became a big part of my journey and, and how I've gotten to where I am. And I'm just super thankful to, to be here, like, like meeting you and I could just quote all of your songs and whatnot, but I grew up listening to them. And, and that, I didn't know that, I thought everyone was like me when I was growing up, you know what I mean? I thought everyone liked all types of music. And, you know, I remember I, I signed, um, when I was at another company, I signed Rod Temperton. And I remember having a dinner with him. And, uh, and I, cause I would always look on the back of records um, when I was a kid, as a lot of kids did. And I'm reading on the back of records. So I get this meeting with Rod Temperton because he's thinking about changing publishers. And so we're at dinner in London and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous as, as, as I don't know what, cause he's one of my favorite songwriters. And so, um, and I, for those of you who don't know, Rod Timberton wrote songs for Michael Jackson, um, Quincy Jones, um, so so many people. But but he's he's a white guy from England who wrote all of these big R and B hits. And another another example that music has no color. You know what I mean? And so I'm sitting with Rod, and we're having the the, the, the general business meeting. And about an hour into the meeting, like. You know, I'm being polite. I'm being the executive, and and I finally I can't take it anymore. And I say, I say to Rod, I said, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. You're one of my favorite songwriters of all time, and and I just started, I just went into fan mode. And he was like, you're you're quite a passionate young man. And and long story short, we we ended up doing. He left that publishing company and came to work with with me um, before he passed away. Um, all those stories, they 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 make up who we are. How did you embrace that, I guess, when you when you started to people started to come to you and tell you that you were opening doors for others and, and whatnot? Did it did it how what was that? What was that trip like? Well, I'll tell you, I, I try to keep my feet on the ground, you know, and stay down to earth. And I like to believe that I've succeeded because in my mind I'm just like at this point I'm a nice Jewish grandmother, but I am aware of all the, the things that I have done that have been recognized and that's kind of the way I think about it that I've always just set out to do a task or a thing or accomplish something or get the next record or or whatever and um like you know I I didn't see any barriers I really didn't I just didn't know they were there and the fact that I have inspired people to go for it whatever it is for them and women in particular who have said, oh, you know, Carol King inspired me to try this or whatever. I think that's great. And I'm really glad that I wasn't conscious of doing it because when you're conscious of doing it, you are um, creating barriers to overcome that have nothing to do with your ability to overcome them. And I want to ask you in turn to talk about that because you faced obstacles but you apparently didn't see them as based, this is an obstacle because I'm black. It was an obstacle and a problem to solve. So talk about that. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I just never um, have viewed myself as a victim. 
I was I wanted to do what I'm doing right now so badly that when I faced an obstacle, I I just took it as a sign that I needed to work harder and work smarter and 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 maybe I wasn't good enough yet, and which just made me dig in even more. And you know, looking back, did were some of those things maybe because of the color of my skin? Maybe. But I think those things make you tougher. I think they make you have thicker skin. And once you do get into, um, I'll just say become successful, you start to realize you're surrounded by other people with thick skin as well. And they may not have gone through the, the journey, the challenges that I've gone through, but they've gone through their own set of challenges, most likely. And it just toughens you up and it, and it, it gives you a resilience that I wouldn't trade my journey for anything in the world. I'll just say it. I won't. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. All parts of it: the good, the bad, and the ugly. I wouldn't trade it for anything because I, I think all the sum of all the parts have made me who I am, and 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 put me in a position to to run the largest music publishing company in the world and work with songwriters like you that wrote America's Songbook. And I'll call it. I don't think that would have happened if I had an easier journey. I just don't. You have to have your goal. You have to go for your goal, do your homework, do the hard work that you have to do to get there, work at it, but just kind of also be confident. And if you have a vision, you have an idea, you know, approach it as if it can be done and that will convey to others. But the other thing that you have that I, I, like, I share and I actually, this I have always been conscious of, and I guess I get it from my dad because he was similar. Like, you know, he'd see the guy in the elevator and say, hey, how you doing? You know, he just acknowledged everybody. And I like to do that because I did not get where I got without so many partners, without business advisors and people who helped me, you know, Lou Adler, for example, in the early days, Sherry today, you know, and. And you, I mean, you are the business side of what I do. And one of the things about you that I treasure is you respect your writers. And it's, it's a mutual sort of respect. Each of us has our role in bringing the music to people. And you are aware of all the people around you and you treat them with respect and you understand the music and who you are and the gifts and the abilities you bring to the work you do, I think is what got you there. I just want to say, you know, I want to, I want to clarify, of course I saw things um, or noticed things on my journey, but there's a couple of ways you could handle it. You can let them beat you down. Do you know what I mean? Or you can, you know, uh, or you can, or you can, or you can deal with it in a different way. I think the best way to deal with it is like, you know, do what they think you can't do or what they're telling you you cannot do. You know what I mean? And, and I always, this last summer, um, someone, I was speaking with someone, I said, if I were to describe my life with someone to this date, and I think it still is, is, is true right now as we're speaking, it's like the ultimate workaround. You know what I mean? I just learned how to work around situations. Like, oh, this is happening. Okay, I'll work around that. Um, this is going on. Okay, I'll work around that. And whether it's right or wrong or fair or unfair, I honestly, I don't really know, to be honest with you. Actually, I do know, but I don't really care to the level to where when I say I don't care, I'm not going to let anything stop me from what I truly believe of, of what the ultimate goal, because the goal is still the goal. And, you know, and, and the reality is um, things are supposed to be hard. Um, when you when you really want special things, it, they, they're not supposed to be easy. And it's supposed to be hard. And I embrace that very early on. And I just think that, and I tell younger people now, like when things are hard, you probably need to lean into that. You know what I mean? You probably need to like take, really refocus because that's, that's just where the magic happens. It's just where the magic happens. And if you love it so that much, it's not really that hard at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Like, it's just... Because it, it, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it because you want to be the best? Or are you doing it because you want to make a lot of money? Or are you doing it because you love it? And if you if it starts with you doing it because you love it, it's probably going to work out for you at the end of the day. At some point, it's going to work out for you. That's really a, a good point. And I would say to people that are coming up now who see the barriers that maybe we, as you said, you were aware that I really wasn't even aware of it. I, I, I just wasn't. I was brought up 
as I can do anything. But for people who say, well, why me? How can I do that? Well, first of all, I would say, why not you? And if you see the barriers, then, you know, like you said, work around them, work past them, just keep going, never give up. I work on an environmental issue, you know, of trying to address climate change by reducing our logging in national forests and saving the northern Rockies. That's where I've encountered obstacles. And they didn't have anything to do with me being a woman. They wouldn't have had anything to do with race if I were, you know, looked like you. But there are obstacles there. And I have been doing that for 30 years. And I will never give up until we get this done. And that to me is the attitude. You, you can be discouraged for a minute, but then you pick yourself up and you keep going because if you have a vision, a goal, a thing you want, you know, and if you want it, especially for the right reasons, you know, if it's all about you, you know, it's okay if you want to go and be a star. Okay, fine, you know, that's great. Then that's your vision and go for it. I'm just saying there is an extra lift, but you'll get the lift from the goodness of what you're trying to do. I think you get the additional lift. I think that's the magic of, of, of leadership is, is do you have the ability to put others before yourself? You know what I'm saying? And that's, it's so funny if you're, cause if you're the leader, you see yourself in front, but if you're, but the, to me, my personal opinion, true leadership is, do you have the ability to put others before you? Um, Roger Faxon, who's been, so instrumental. He actually was the key to unlocking the leadership code for me, to be honest with you. Um, and, I, and I'll come back to that. But he he came in my office in, in LA and he he um, he gave me a raise and it was a pretty decent raise, but it was like not in my contract or whatever. And I was just like, wow, what, what is, what is I, I get? Thank you. First of all, but like, why, why did he say, well, you know, you, you've, you you're figuring it out. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I thought I was figuring it out. I was pretty good at what I did. And he said, you know, you, you are now bringing people along with you on the journey. And, and that year I had started working with some other people in the company, not in A&R, which is the, the part that I were in. And he was like, you're including people. And he said, you don't, he said, I know you're, you're thinking what it does for you. He said, but you don't know what it's doing for them. And, and he said, you're figuring it out. And it was like, he unlocked the code, you know what I mean? And, and, and because, you know, in, in the music business in particular, A&R is kind of like a singular role, you know what I mean? It's like you have your own little thing and you're working with your artist that you're working with and you're in your own little silo, um, for lack of a better word. And, and that's okay. But if you really want to lead a team and run a company and so on and so forth, you have to be inclusive. And, and you have to like trust people. You know what I mean? Roger Faxon is, is a white man who was the first person to say, I think you should run EMI Music Publishing when, um, when I leave. And they sold it from under us, but, um, but I'm back running Sony ATV. But he, he said that he believed in me. Jody Gerson hired me, you know what I mean, in 1995. And, and then Steve Cooper, who is at Warner Music Group, um, was the first person to say to me, I want you to run Warner Chapel Music Publishing. You know, three three white people who saw something in me, and you know, you could be you could be given the opportunity or present the opportunity, but it's up to you to make something out of the opportunity. You know, when you were you when you were um, you know coming up and you're asking people, can you hear my songs? Can you listen to my? When you get the opportunity, then show up. You know what I mean? And then we'll see what happens. But I want to go back to your environmental story, and you say you've been working on this for thirty years, and you know, a, a really close friend of mine. It brings, brings me back to something a close friend of mine told me or um, when I was younger in the business. And he said, everybody, basically everyone who has a dream will get an opportunity to realize that dream. He said, there's no losers in anything. There's only those who quit before their turn comes. And I just carried that with me throughout my entire career. I've got, I've just picked up little gems from people along the way, but that was something that was so meaningful because it's true. I was 30 years old when I got the opportunity to work at EMI Music Publishing as the lowest man on the totem pole, by the way, at 30 years old. And a few months before that, I started to think like, am I crazy like for pursuing this dream, like broken LA and am I crazy? And, and, and I tell the story, I tell it in my own way. I said, I, I almost like wimped out 
and was like, I was just going to go back to Denver and DJ. You know what I mean? And it was, I said, it's almost like God was like, all right, all right, all right. Let's let's open the door for this guy. He's going to quit on us. Like, let's just, he's worked hard enough. Let's, let's let him in. And, but you have to keep working at it if you truly believe in it, because you will get your shot. I, I firmly believe that. I firmly believe that. And if, if you don't get there this way, try that way, go around it, go a different way. And if you end up, you know, sometimes life brings you to a different career that maybe is the career you should be doing. So if you want to be a rock star or, a, you know, great gospel singer or whatever and have fame and fortune and that doesn't happen, you may find your path is somewhere else and you will find a way to serve God or the community or whatever your, you know, service is. Be attuned to what your path is. Have your dream, try to get there and along the way, let yourself be guided and, and, and work with, I don't know, with a spirit of can do, I will do this, I will master this, I will achieve this. And maybe you will and maybe you won't, but the journey itself is amazing. Is oh, Wow, you just touched on something that I, I, I wouldn't have remembered to bring up is when I left EMI, um, and EMI was the number one music publisher at, at that time before it was sold. And I went to Warner Chapel who was um, not, we'll just say not the best. Um, um, and so I was in Denver um, for whatever reason and I was riding with a friend of mine and he said, what's the difference? And he's not in the music business. He said, what's the difference between the other company you worked at and this company? And no one had ever asked me that, nor had I ever thought about it. And I said, well, you know, at the other company I worked at, we were the best. We were number one, like we were the best all the time. I said, in this company, um, it's not the best, um, but we're working to be the best. I said, but I learned something about myself along the way. I said, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, being the best is like, being known as the best is like amazing. Who wouldn't want to be known as the best? I said, but it's, and it's fun. I said, it's really fun. I said, but it's not as fun as the journey to be in the best. And and it just you just when you just said that, you just reminded me of that. And and I and I, I firmly believe that like everyone's path, you know, success or hardships or whatever, it's all part of the journey. I just look at people and I get excited. Like the young people that I work with at, at Sony Music Publishing, I'm like, oh my God, they have no freaking idea like how fun this journey is going to be for them. And I think when we be, come into these roles, like you, you give back so much with your time. And, you know, with, for me, it's it's a different thing. I think when we when we get into these roles, you have to remember the things that, for me, that I've been through and and if I can, you know, um, inspire and give opportunities to others, then then I have to do that. And I, I actually honor that and I and I embrace it. And you have to just do what you feel is right. If you're doing what you feel is right, it doesn't mean you're right. But if you if you doing what you believe is right, you could just impact so many things in business and just in the world. And, you know, the, the last thing I'll say is, is it was an eye opener for me on the responsibility. Um, that I have is, is, you know, I was, um, he's actually since passed away, but I was talking a couple of years ago before I came to Sony, um, to a guy named Andre Harrell and Andre Harrell ran Uptown Records and, you know, Mary J. Blige, um, Jodeci and even P. Diddy, all are his, all of, you know, his creations. He said, you know, you know, Big John, you going where none of us have gone before. And, and I was like, I said, what do you mean? He said, none of us have ever achieved what you have just achieved. Now, these are people who I thought were way more successful than me and achieved way more than me, people that I looked up to. And, and I thought about it. I was like, damn, he's right. I, ne I never looked at it that way. I never looked at it to be the first, you know, African-American to run a major music publishing company. And it just it just let me know the responsibility. My responsibility is to do a great job. Because if I do a great job, then I create opportunities for a lot of people. And I think a lot of people, they lose sight of that and they get caught up in the fight. And the fight is important, but you also have to be great at what you do. That's the biggest thing that you have to offer 
to open the doors for others. And I look at the 50th anniversary of Tapestry, like you're great at what you do. You're nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for the second time. And that is it opened so many doors and inspiring so many others. And that's just you being you. So I just wanna applaud you for that. You know, the most fun thing for me to do is have a conversation with somebody. And I truly, truly have enjoyed this. And I love working with you. And, you know, thank you for the work you do. And thank you for breaking barriers just by being who you are and doing what you do. Keep doing it. I love you. Love you too. And I can't wait to come to Idaho and go to the cafe and have some lemonade and chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> right on. I, traveling, traveling will be nice. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Carol, for doing this. I really appreciate okay, it. Okay, John, you take right. care. You too. Bye-bye.